Good morning, everyone. It's 10 o'clock, so we'll call the meeting to order. Uh, item number two on the agenda is to approve the minutes of the meeting of May 9th, 2019. I have a motion and a second on item two. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Uh, item three is the consent docket. We have one item, the certification of election results. and. Say congratulations to Jamie. We're very glad to have you, you. with us again. So. Second. I have a motion to second on item three. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Item four is to ratify approvals. We have two items. Second. I have a motion to second on item four. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Item five is to approve the claims docket. Second. Have a motion and a second on item five. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Item six is to approve the following applications for service retirement. Have a motion and a second on item six. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Item seven is to receive the report of death, authorized payment of the $5,000 death benefit, and authorize the secretary to make necessary changes to conform on the following. I have a motion and a second on item seven. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Item eight is to approve the following application of vested rights. Motion to second on item eight. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Item nine is items for individual consideration. Uh, it's the Asset Consulting Group LLC non discriminatory consulting agreement. This item was deferred from our last meeting. Does anybody have any questions? I know Randy was concerned that it wasn't included, but it's in our packet. So I trust everyone's had a chance to take a look at it. So I have a motion to second on item 9A. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Item 10, investment consultant report. Good morning, Jason. Good morning. I uh, changed my flight pattern, so I'm no longer taking the 930 flight that it's delayed till three in the morning. And that's what happened to me last month. So that's why I went here. I decided not to, to wait till 3.30 in the morning. Um, so you, you should all have the, the ASAP in, in front of you for the, for the monthly report. Um, just touch on a, on a couple of things. Uh, you'll see May was a, a tough month. Portfolio was down in May, bounced back uh, a bit in June. Um, but really it's a story of uh, con continuing concerns about trade and tariffs that have really spooked the markets and slowing global growth. Uh, it's what con the concerns that we had in uh, the fourth quarter of last year that saw uh, led to equity markets declining pretty rapidly. Then the rhetoric around that changed a bit and you had a pretty big bounce back in the beginning of the year. F economic fundamentals are still fairly good in, in the U.S. Unemployment's very low. Uh, wage wages are, are growing, but financial securities are still priced high. Uh, U.S. stocks and non-U.S. stocks are pretty fairly uh, are richly valued uh, as we've come through a 10-year period of very strong returns, and we have very low yields. That's been a big driver of uh, relative performance over the last six months with the the decline in Treasury yields. The 10-year Treasury. Uh, as of this morning was at 2.12. So we do have uh, an inverted yield curve in terms of Fed funds rate at 2.5% and then 30 years at about 2.4, uh, I think. 10 year is at 2.1. Uh, so the, the yield curve is inverted on the front end uh, from the Fed funds rate, but then it's uh, a normal yield curve <laughs> Uh, intermediate to, to longer term. And that's really where you're starting to hear uh, comments that the Fed may need to, to lower rates. 
really moving away from potentially it would be a divergence from what we've heard from the Fed the last 10 years, which is data dependent. This is really market dependent, and the data point is, is something that they haven't historically looked at. Uh, comments in the last week that they're, they're, they're 80 percent uh, probability that the Fed will, will lower rates at the at the next meeting as you've seen stocks bounce back uh, pretty pretty well over the last seven to ten days if that doesn't happen we could envision markets really selling off pretty pretty dramatically uh, not based on fundamentals but just based on on Fed action um, so it's not to say that I'm not suggesting one way or the other what they what they should do, but just the, the potential ramifications of that. On a one-year basis now, as we, we sit here today, really U.S. investment-grade bonds, primarily treasuries, are the best performing asset class because as yields, yields have come down, those bond prices have gone up. So on a trailing one-year basis through yesterday, the Barclays Ag is up about 7.4% followed by large cap stocks at 5.5%. So bonds, primarily treasuries, outperforming U.S. large cap stocks, but still on a one-year basis, mid-single-digit mid returns. All other asset classes, uh, long-only asset classes, are negative. Small cap stocks on a trailing one year are down 8%. Non-U.S. developed stocks are down 3%. And emerging markets are down 7.5% uh, on a trailing one year through yesterday. Commodities down about 12 percent. Year to date those numbers are, are different, but you can just see the uh, year to date, calendar year to date through the first five and a half months now, you've got double digit returns, but still uh, big losses in that fourth quarter are impacting one year returns pretty dramatically. So as we look at your portfolio on page two, uh, the total fund gross of fees up about 1.5% on a trailing one year through the end of May. The policy index or the asset allocation would be a positive 186, so about 30 basis points behind that. The primary drivers of that are two things. Uh, the, the biggest relative uh, driver to that dispersion is your fixed income. Um, your fixed income We've, we've talked a lot about this. You have much less sensitivity to interest rate movements, and that's because intermediate to longer term, in a very low yield environment where 10-year treasuries have been averaging, you know, somewhere between one and a half and three percent the last 10 years. Uh, we've touched over three percent a couple of times in that period. You need to get seven and a half percent on your or 7.1 percent now. You've brought that down uh, over time, which is which has been beneficial. But still, seven plus percent return. So having a significant amount of, of your assets in an asset class that we know is going to get something less than seven percent is an impediment. So you've done some things to, within your fixed income to have less reliance on U.S. interest rate movements, more credit exposure more non-U.S. exposure and currency exposure. That was not rewarded in this most recent period, and you see that reflected in your fixed income composite, which is up a little under 4% on a trailing one-year basis, where the aggregate benchmark, which is what we measure against, up 6.4%. So that is much more influenced by Treasury yields coming down than your portfolio is. You're not getting the, the benefit from that. But intermediate to longer term, having some fixed income instruments that are, or strategies that can drive returns through other means other than interest rate or duration sensitivity, credit at sector uh, selection, we think is beneficial without taking on equity risk. And it has helped uh, over longer periods. If you look at that 10-year number for your overall fixed income composite, it's up about 5% over the trailing 10 years, whereas the benchmark is up 3.8 percent. So you did get a significant uh, uh, premium to traditional core bonds without taking on a lot more risk from, from that. But in the one year, that's a 25 percent allocation, so it's a fourth of your assets, your overall fixed income, underperforming the policy component by about 2.5 percent. So that has a big impact on that 30 basis points overall. The other component that, that on a one-year basis that, that has hurt a little bit is within your large cap, your other 
second largest allocation of 20% of your assets on a target basis and you're a little overweight to large cap. The Intec strategy, which is makes up about half of that, uh, in 2018 uh, lagged the, the benchmark by quite a bit. That strategy is intended to be a uh, benchmark risk con controlled strategy. It doesn't take on a lot of benchmark risk, uh, but their process, uh, it is a volatility capture strategy, which means they're picking from the universe of stocks in the Russell 1000 or the large cap universe. Uh, their optimization process will overweight stocks that have a higher volatility to the, to the market and to other stocks. What that tends to, to lead to is an overweighting of the smaller companies within the large cap index. Last year, small cap, and this isn't small cap, but smaller capitalization companies underperform mega and larger cap companies by, by quite a bit. So this is pretty consistent with the pattern we've seen in this intact strategy over time when there is a pretty a significant change between uh, leadership, between mega, large and, and smaller capitalized companies that tends to happen to this strategy. So not inconsistent with what we've seen. More recently, year to date, you can see on a calendar year to date, your large cap is outperformed by about one and a half percent. That's all in tech because the other half of uh, the, your large cap is the index strategy. So year to date, in tech is outperformed by over two percent. So that's certainly bouncing back. Your small cap managers, uh, while absolute returns haven't been great on a, on a trailing one year, as I mentioned, trailing one year, small caps down about 8% through yesterday, 4.5% through the end of May. Your small cap managers, Ernest and Times Square, have actually eked out a positive return. And year to date, very good returns. And a lot of that was Times Square on the growth side. Um, See on one year, they're are year to date up 18 and a quarter percent, about seven percent ahead of the benchmark. Uh, Times Square up actually 22 and a half percent year to date. So they've really made a, a a big bounce back on a on a year to date basis. The long short composite helping year to date, and we're actually getting what we anticipated from this transition to Mauna Kea, a little bit more upside, while, while still getting that downside protection uh, in a period, you've really only had uh, the Mauna Kea strategy uh, since August of last year. Uh, but since that time, uh, and this is on, on the next page three, the, the composite that you see here goes back and has your uh, the, the, the K2 overseas fund combined with Mauna Kea. Uh, if we look on page three, it's just the Mauna Kea strategy and year to date, uh, that portfolio is up 11% versus the long only bench global benchmark up 9.3. So in a period where global stocks have done well, actually out, long short has actually outperformed. So you're getting a little bit more bang for the buck, which is something that we were trying to do, but still getting that good downside protection. You'll see it in the month of May down 2.5%, whereas the global benchmark was down 5.8%. So uh, certainly like that. Um, one thing to mention there, if you go back to page two, the long short equity composite market value at the end of May was 67.3 million. That includes the hold back from K2 overseas. So when you redeem from the K2 overseas fund, there is a audit hold back, uh, so awaiting their year end audit and then they will release that, that money. Uh, we're expecting that that should be coming back sometime next month, uh, that seven, seven million uh, in cash. And so we'll need to make a, real, uh, a recommendation on reallocating that within the Mauna Kea fund because you're still under, underweight the target of 10%. 10, 10 and so we'll do that uh, next month. Uh, other uh, pieces of the portfolio, the, the international and emerging strategies while down have protected on a trailing one year and pretty good returns uh, more recently on a, on a year to date basis. So no, <laughs> no manager concerns at this time. Um, we're, we're pleased with the portfolio. Uh, one of the things that we are, uh, 
we, ha we haven't done here in a while is just revisit the overall asset allocation. Uh, that's something that, not, not that I would anticipate suggesting major changes to this, but it's something that we should look at every couple of years. So probably, uh, I know next month you change your meeting and I, uh, I won't be able to be here, Patty will, but maybe in August we'll revisit the uh, asset allocation because one of the things we are looking at um, and I know there won't be major gasps at this, is the commodities allocations. Commodities has been a pretty tough uh, asset class the last several years. That's not why we're revisiting this. In our long-term capital market assumptions this year, we have revised our long-term inflation assumption because we don't believe, based on global demographics, aging population in the U.S., aging population in Europe and developed Asia, as well as technology advancements that we're going to see inflation at the same level as long-term historical inflation has been, closer to 3.5%, 3.75%. So our long-term inflation assumption and our capital market assumptions has come down by about 1%. That had a big impact on our commodities assumption because commodities were tied, tied to inflation. And so now from a strategic standpoint, when we do modeling, commodities isn't, the, the volatility or risk is still very high. That's not coming down. The return has come down to a point where it, it's not looking attractive on a strategic basis. So we are revisiting some of those allocations and uh, something that we'll want to look at and talk, talk to you about in this portfolio. Um, other than that, thank you for the, uh, on the, uh, the participant directed plans, uh, that's, that's the contract that you uh, approved, uh, non-discretionary, not discriminatory, but we won't discriminate in our evaluation either. <laughs> uh, that's, I think the plan is to, to review those, uh, those plans and come back with some recommendations in like uh, three or four months on, on each of those uh, plans that, that the city sponsors. Any other questions? I have one. Where is the public funds trustee meeting this year? <laughs> Somebody asked me that before, and I, I sent a. I, Isn't it in Tulsa? It is in Tulsa, but I don't know where. We're not hosting it this year, or not. not okay. One of our clients isn't hosting it. So. Well, we haven't talked the actual agendas or anything yet. We've just got to save the date, which is just the date. So we haven't got any confirmations on anything yet. We're hoping in the next week or two that we'll have those. Because teachers, teachers is doing it this year. Okay. Hopefully it's not at the River Spirit Casino. No, I don't think it's. I don't it. think so. But I'll, I'll I'll send the dates out just for you. I'll have those, and I can see if I can reach out to Joe and see if I can get maybe a location and let okay. you know. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item number uh, 11 is comments from board staff and citizens. Absolutely. Okay, uh, we are adjourned at 1019. Thank you.